What's poppin' me, Hunter? Your boy is back with yet another video. This video is going to be all about ledge grabbing, which is a new feature I've implemented within the Symphony of the Night hacked project. This feature will not apply to legacy characters such as Rondo Richter, but does apply to Alucard. This video is designed to not only function as a reference for myself, but it will hopefully be helpful to anybody else out there who might be struggling to set up the same feature within their own 2D platforming game. Something I have noticed about the vast majority of Unity tutorial videos out there is that they are very generic. That is to say, they're designed to appeal to the broadest possible demographic that they can in an effort to secure more views for the video's creator. That's not going to be the case here. These videos are all specifically designed for 2D platformers. Now, can you find the information in these videos useful for other types of games? Absolutely. However, I just wanted to take a moment and let everybody know what this is going to be geared towards, so I'm not wasting anybody's time. And with that, let's dive right into the video. Alright, so first up, I do need to go into my character setup a little bit, only so that the rest of this video will make sense. I would like to elaborate on this further in another video because I think this subject in particular will definitely come in handy for a lot of people who are new to Unity out there. But for now, I'll just briefly touch on it. The first tip I'll give anybody out there who is new to Unity is this. Absolutely, positively do not rely on getting information from the animator to figure out what state your character is in. What I mean by this is using methods such as get current animator state info and get current animator clip info. Working with strings is a headache and these methods are very limiting. Now, can they be used in addition to you setting up your own state system? Absolutely, in which case they're very powerful tools, but what you want to get from this is set up your own state system. Set up a variable to store what state your character is currently in, the state it was previously in, the name of the animation in a string that it's going to, and the time the animation started at. Trust me when I say having those four variables alone will make debugging much easier, much quicker, and make your code much more readable. As you can see, I do have my current state and previous state variables here, and they each store a type of state. Now, don't pay any mind to the rest of this. Um, again, I'll elaborate on it in a further video. What you need to know is the state that Alucard is currently in is stored within current state. Also, set up your own master states list for all of your player character classes. Even if you think you will only have one, trust me. Make a master list, which minus shared states, and then create a separate one for each character class that inherits from that one. You can see Alucard is called state, and each of these inherits from shared states. And I did this because this way, when I go into my code, if I end up having code that's shared between different character classes, I can be sure that the values are always going to be correct and always valid. In Alucard's individual code, I can then do this. I can use current state and simply check for state dot and the name. And this makes the code very, very readable as you can see here. It also ensures that every time a state is set in here, um, it's going to be valid. And every time I try to check a state in here, only valid options will come up. Versus if I had huge if I had used shared states instead, pardon me, I would have to constantly check and make sure that the state value we're passing in or that's currently set in there is valid. And that just adds an extra step to your code that you don't want to have to deal with. So what you want to take away from this is again, create a master states list and have each of your character classes inherit their values from that master states list. If you think that this takes time to type out, you could easily set this up by going into Excel using some concatenation and some addition methods and get this all typed out for you. All right, so now that we've gotten the necessary setup information out of the way, let's see the ledge grabbing in action. All right, so a little bit about the controls here. How you grab onto a ledge is holding left or right as you're falling and Alucard automatically grabs on. If you tap up, you climb up. Pretty simple stuff. However, some basics about ledge grabbing I need to go over is that when you hang from a ledge, your double jump and your air rush as well as your stomp bounces are all refreshed. 
So, you can do something like this. You'll excuse that first demonstration. It was not the best. But you can see how fluid it is, how fast it is, and how smooth it is. You can also, while you're hanging off a ledge, hit down and jump to just let go. And if you want to stomp, you can simply double tap it, because it's the same controls. Of course, there's an enemy near you, you can attack like normal as well. Now, this was inspired by the game's Metroid Zero Mission and Salt Sanctuary, both excellent games. However, both of those had their flaws that I wanted to clean up here. I wanted to make it a bit faster and smoother than both of those games so that you could actually use this in combat. Um, not to mention, I can set up all kinds of insidious ledge grabbing, double jumping, and air rush combination puzzles. No, I'm not talking anything crazy like in Hollow Knight and the Path of Pain, which let's not even talk about that evil place, but I'm digressing. Let's see this in combat and see how it works, combined with air chains. First up, allow me to demonstrate what an air chain is. The majority of weapons have attack combinations where if you use one attack after another, you'll go into a series of progressively stronger attacks. Think of Devil May Cry, for example, or God of War, or Lords of Shadow. In Alucard's case, for this type of weapon, he will actually hover while doing his air chain, and that's probably going to be the case for the majority of the air chains out there. You start hovering around the time you start falling, so if I let go of the jump button, do this... I can actually precisely pinpoint where I want to hover. If I'm falling from above, like this, because I'm falling, it'll automatically make me stop in midair. If I don't want to do this, I can simply stomp out of it, or I can air rush away, or I can stop attacking and double jump out. I can also use, in this case, the critical art for it. It'll make you start falling. So the bottom line is, you're not stuck in midair if you don't want to be. You also have diagonal attacks which don't hover. So you have some options here, and as I said, your critical doesn't hover. Okay, so now let's combine this with some ledge grabbing and check out some antics. If I can avoid getting lit on fire like an idiot. Alright, I'm going to move him away. Give me a second here, guys. He's a little too close for what I want to show you all. Alright, so I'm back from altering time and space. Let's dive back in here. See how that works? Nice, fluid, smooth, and most of all, simple. And let's say, for example, I'm hanging off this ledge and I didn't really want to hover. I just want to do a quick strike and get back on the ground. I have that option. But as you can see, it's pretty fluid. It's pretty simple. Also, earlier in the video, I mentioned refreshing your stomp bounces. This is what I was referring to. Even from this distance, you can go ahead and hit down and jump to let go of the ledge, and then hit down and jump again quickly if you want to bounce off something right below you, which could come in handy. And again, just another aspect I could use to come up with some very devious aerial puzzles here. All right, so now you've seen the ledge grab in action. Let's take a look at the code itself. However, before we look at the code itself, you do need to see the colliders directly tied to that code. I also need to briefly discuss how my collision engine and movement engine works. And that is to say, I coded my own. The character moves one pixel at a time, and each time he moves, checks for collision with any solids, enemies, etc. The character has a main horizontal collider, which you can see here. And this ensures you don't get stuck in anything. I do not use ray casting. The reason I don't use ray casting is let's say you ray cast here, in the middle, and the bottom, which is common information you see all over the Unity forums. Guess what? If there's a small solid here that was 4x4 pixels, it's going to pass between those ray cast, them ray casts, and you're going to walk right through it like it's not there. Versus a box collider, you can use the overlap collider method, and it's going to check to make sure there's absolutely nothing within it. I also set up several other colliders, including a horizontal one, and these all derive from this main collider. They're done programmatically. I can use a draw gizmo to go ahead and show you these other colliders that are programmatically handled. See here? Here's the horizontal one. If you notice, it's actually a little smaller 
than the main one that was around the character. The reason is because I have something coded in so that these four pixels here, if you run into a solid that's four pixels or smaller, you'll walk right onto it. If you're not sure why I'd want to do this, think of slopes or think of switches you can walk right onto that might be very small. This way you don't get stuck on them. And this is here if you're moving to the right, it's to the right. If you're moving left, it's to the left, so the direction you're moving in. It's based on your X speed, so it doesn't matter what direction the character's facing, so we aren't checking in unnecessary directions for collisions. The vertical one is here. Again, these are boxes. I just drew two lines to make it simple. But if you're standing still or falling downward, it's below you. If you're jumping upward, it's above you here. And this is all directly above the player's main collision box, which I'm going to enable now. I just disabled it because, again, it partially hides it and it's a little hard to see. Also, to be clear, when I'm talking about a collision box, this is just for checking with solids. It is not the hurt box, meaning this is not what checks if you ran into an enemy and should take damage. You want to separate those two things out from the beginning or you will be in hell later, trust me. Also, this is of importance, I use two layers for solid tiles. Tile layer 8, which is visible by default, and you can see that here. And tile layer 9, which is invisible. If you're not sure why I'd need two of them or why you would need two of them, think of it this way. If you have your floors, your ceilings, um, your walls, you want those all visible. However, what happens if later on you find a gap somewhere in them because of your tile layer mapping or you need to put in an extra solid somewhere to block off something? That invisible layer comes in handy. Trust me, use two layers for your solid objects. It's again, a life-saving tip. I'll elaborate on these things in another video. Okay, so next up we need to talk about the ledge grabbing itself. Let's go ahead and shut off these draw gizmos which come in handy for debugging. Again, character's main collider is right here. You'll see three more above it. This small single pixel one is what checks for a solid in front. It has to be touching a solid and then it'll run some calculations to check, okay, are you holding forward? And then it will use this one pixel big collider box and it'll check above it to see is there a one pixel space free? Because think about it. Let's say you're touching a solid but there's no space here. You shouldn't grab onto anything. You'll also notice the size is slightly below a pixel. That has to do with Unity's collision engine and the way it runs checks. Um, this will save you a lot of headaches. If you're looking for something to grab onto, make it slightly below a pixel. This way, if there's any rounding going on behind the scenes, it doesn't screw up the collision detection and tell you, give you a false reading is the best way I can put it. I could go into a lot more detail here, but just, just, just take my word on this one. We also have to have another collider for climbing up because this is the space the character is initially going to climb up into. You'll notice this is slightly forward because he's going to climb upward and then move forward slightly to get onto the ledge. Let's go ahead and see this in practice. It'll make a lot more sense. Okay, so you'll notice we have the ledge grab collider. It's touching a solid and there's free space here. And then we have this ledge gap collider, or excuse me, the ledge climb up collider. We'll talk about ledge gap in a second. See how we have space here to move upward and forward. Now the character goes into crouching, so we don't need to check for a full-size collider box here. If I go back to the character, he has a smaller box. Now this means you can crawl into a smaller space. Let me show you in practice exactly why you want to make sure you check that you're touching that one pixel and that there's free space here. You could run into a scenario like this, for example, where you have something that's moving around and coming down and closing, and look what's going to happen when it gets down that one pixel and there's no space, see how Alucard lets go. This is so you don't end up stuck if you have moving platforms. Let's say you were riding, this was a moving platform, it was moving up into this, you should automatically fall. The same thing here, if there's room to, let's say, grab on, but not climb up, that's why we have this ledge climb up. See how this is blocked? Notice I'm tapping up right now, he's not climbing up. Now I'm going to go ahead and move this out of the way while I'm holding up. Notice as soon as he had room, he crawled up into there. Now we can just slide out. So yes, you want to have one to check, is there something to grab onto? And then you can use this single one here 
to do a calculation one pixel up to check for free space. And then you need one to check if you have space to move up and then move forward. And here, I'm actually going to pause it as he's climbing up and show you what happens if suddenly that space becomes filled. All right, so now let's see what happens if you're in the middle of climbing up, because this is just moving you upwards and then moving you forward, and then suddenly a block is in the way. Now we're in mid-animation, and notice this block is going to begin preoccupying the space. Watch what Alucard does. He just drops off. And this is why you want to have these two colliders in here. You always want to make sure you check, not just is there something for you to touch. Oops, excuse me, I keep clicking around wrong. Not only are you touching something, not only is there a free space here, but is there room to climb up upwards and forwards. And finally, we're going to talk about this ledge gap collider. Now, if you look on screen, you might notice something funny. This is a very thin ledge, and somehow Alucard is hanging from it. Now, it is a solid ledge. It's not a jump-through one. If it was a jump-through one, he could hang from it like this and climb up onto it. But it's a solid one. So what's going on here? Well, that's what this ledge gap collider is for. You'll notice if you look at the screen, there is his main collider here, and then the ledge climb up one. The smaller one, again, is the ledge grab one. Because there's a space between the ledge climb up one and his main collider, we need to check here before we attempt to hang from anything and make sure that in that space is not a solid blocking us. If we did not, you could do this with thin platforms. Now, keep in mind, that only applies to thin platforms, which I'm not planning on using any of these. If we use them on a thicker one, notice nothing's happening. But, this is part of what I call writing good code. Accounting for those things that you don't think will happen, because you never know what's going to happen down the line. How your game is going to change, for example. Let me go ahead and enable this. Notice he's not grabbing on anymore now. That's because this is being checked before he grabs on. What it does is it looks, it checks this, and it says, okay, you're touching a pixel. Let's say when it was over here, I'm going to move him back over because I know this is a big visual thing. Let's say over here, it does that pixel check. We're touching a solid. Checks a pixel above. There's free space. Then it checks this gap one. And what it'll do is it'll check this and go, okay, we're touching a solid if it was active. All right, let's try to move back several pixels. I think I set it to up to a six pixel distance. And this is why your ledge grabbing doesn't have to be too precise movement wise. You can be moving diagonally against a thin platform like this and you'll still grab onto it. Because what happened is in reality, you can't see it because it happens too quick in game. But what happened was as he moved diagonally, he was actually about here when he attempted the ledge grab. Now what would happen is because of this gap collider, this here would return and say, okay, well, you know, I'm, excuse me, let me correct myself. He was about here, and this was about here. And what happened was it checked here and said, okay, there's free space above, there's something to grab onto here, and it said, but this space over here with the mouses is preoccupied by the ledge gap. So it moved him back about four pixels, and it said, okay, now there's free space, so put him here. This is so that if you're dealing with thin platforms and you're moving horizontally in the air, it doesn't have to be so precise. Um, if it's still hard to picture, there's a lot of games that used to have problems with things like this. When it came to ledge grabbing, you try to grab onto a ledge and miss it for that reason when you were moving through the air. This solves that issue. That's the best way I can make a long story very short without spending 20 minutes explaining the minutia of it. And finally, we get to the code here. Now the video's going on 20 minutes long, so I'm not going to go into too many details here as I could easily spend an hour going through all this. But here's the movement code. It attempts to move the player by one pixel. Assuming there's no invalid movement condition, it will move them one pixel and then run physics2d.sync transforms. If you are going to move things with the transform, you want to run this before you do collision checks. What it will do is, internally within Unity, it will update all the collider boxes to account for the fact that a transform was moved. This is a very efficient method. It will only update any transforms that changed. So for example, if I'm running a loop here to move the player four pixels, he's the only thing that moved in that loop. So it's going to move him one pixel, update his transform, and that's it. You could 
probably update 10,000 transforms every frame non-stop and you wouldn't notice a difference. So don't worry about this. The relevant part is down here where it says, if check ledge grab, and that's just here because legacy characters can't grab ledges, it will run the collision script to attempt to grab the ledge. If it does, you're not going to move anymore. It stops movement checking right now. Going to the collision engine, we have a couple of methods in here. The first one is one to climb up a ledge, which there's that ledge climb collider. It's going to go ahead and check and go, okay, um, let's go ahead and run a check using the solids contact filter, which the solids contact filter is set to layers 8 and 9. Remember earlier in the video, I said 8 or 9 of your solids? That's why I mentioned that. It's very relevant here. However, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. This is ledge climb up. Let's pull up ledge grab. Hold on one moment, guys. All right, here we are, ledge grabbing. Sorry about that. I got mixed up for a second. Okay, so pretty simple. If there's no ledge grab collider, we're not going to do anything. If there is, okay, we need to record the starting position before the characters moved at all. And then what we're going to do is we're going to run two loops here. The first loop is going to be to simply see if that collider is touching a solid, which I use an extension method there, that's all this is. Now, what it's going to do is if it's touching a solid, okay, great. We can grab a ledge. Let's go ahead and move on to the next check. And again, it checks layers 8 and 9 with the solids contact filter, which is all we care about right now. Now on the second check, what we're going to do is, remember earlier in the video I said we need to move one space above that ledge grab collider? Here it is. It's going to move it up one. Again, we moved the transform, so sync transforms. It'll update for this one transform change. And then we're going to run the second part of the loop, which checks for an impassable solid. If you touch one, that means there's no free space. We're done. We don't need to do anything else. Also, if can grab ledge is not set on the first loop, same thing. No need to run the second. Get us out of here. Now, if we made it through the checks, we need to go ahead and reset the ledge grab collider to its starting position, which is why we recorded it up there. And now, if we can grab the ledge and the player isn't already in the ledge climb state, we need to go ahead and check that ledge gap collider and make sure there's nothing in our way to keep us from grabbing it. And the reason this is run is because it's also run, we also have this check rather, is because this is ran in fixed update as well every step just in case that free space above the ledge grab collider is gone. Remember the example earlier with the block moving downward? This way you'll drop off. So we need these extra checks here. It's a long story made short. Now we're going to check the ledge gap collider. Now if we check that and the ledge gap collider is not touching a solid, which we have a helper method down here that just again checks that with solids, returns true or false with the first one it hits. Um, or returns true if it hits with the first solid it hits, so we're not going through unnecessary iterations. Then just run the event, which is going to attempt to grab onto the ledge, and that's nice and simple, nothing else to say there. But, if for some reason that ledge gap collider is touching a solid, remember earlier in the video I mentioned it'll try to move you over a couple of pixels? Well, that's what's going on here, it's four pixels, not six. It'll go ahead and check and attempt to move you in the opposite direction. So you're facing right, it'll try to move you left to four pixels. If at any point you're now touching a solid, well, we can't do it. You're not going to grab onto the ledge. If it can move you over without you touching a solid, then it's going to go ahead and run the event to send you to the ledge grabbing animation state. You will also notice if it fails, if it gets to the max number of checks here, four pixels, it'll put back your position. This way we don't end up with any kind of glitches or anything like that. Also notice every time it moves, sync transforms. There it is again, guys. Unfortunately, there's no command to just sync one particular transform. But again, this only syncs transforms that have changed. And because we're running through a loop and the only thing here being moved is the player, the player is the only transform that's being updated. So again, almost non-existent resource cost there. Very efficient method to run. Okay, so now what we have done is jump over to where the attempt to grab ledge event is located and you can see only one method subscribes to it. One more quick thing I want to show you guys related to this and that's in fixed update. You can see here, remember that check ledge grab parameter we have in 
the method I was showing you before in move player. That's passed from this main method up here. Move player begin. And you can see we have check ledge grab there. And then attempt to move player one pixel. And it leads here. So now we've gone full circle. That's where that parameter is set. And that's used because what it does is it checks the X input to see if you're pressing in the direction your character's facing. And if you're falling downward or if you're moving downward or not moving at all, which don't worry, there's another check to make sure you're in the air that I'm gonna show you in a minute. But I just wanted to show you where this all starts off moving the player here. Going back to the event though, we're subscribed to attempt to grab ledge. So let's go over there. And now you'll notice this is in the shared player data, so it works for all player classes. Okay, so we look at the tag that's used. Is the player in an air attack? This is a normal air attack. This is a critical art an air sub or an air crash. If they're attacking, we need to see if this attack can be canceled because if you're at the end of, let's say, a jumping slash to the point where you could cancel it with another jumping slash, you should be able to grab onto the ledge to interrupt the attack. If they're not, well, doesn't matter. They need to continue the attack, move on. You can only, besides that exception, the only time you can grab a ledge is in air movement. Remember what I said a moment ago about checking that you're in some kind of air movement because your V speed, would, or your Y speed, excuse me, would equal zero when you're walking on the ground. So if you're not in some kind of air movement, we're not going to attempt this either. Otherwise, we're going to go to ledge grab. Remember way back in the conversation where I mentioned sometimes you might have code shared between different player classes? Here it is. That's why you see shared states. This is in shared player data, player main. Totally separate from Alucard and Richter's code. But this will be used by all player classes. It knows to automatically go to this method. Here's the animation name, which is going to be recorded in the variable I mentioned about 20 minutes ago in the video that I said to make sure you store the string for the animation's name it's going to go to. And here's the state the player itself is going to go to. So let's go ahead and jump over to the code that initializes that. It's right here. First thing it does is reset landing bars and play sound. Let's jump over to that method so you can just see what's in there. All it is is a check first to make sure we're not in dash or in walk. So skip over that. That's not relevant. Now what we're doing is we want to remove, we want to remove, excuse me, the Y speed. We want to reset the number of jumps, air rushes, stop bounces, and air chain hovers used. And then reset the number of max air chains. And that's it for ledge grabbing. We're done. I mentioned all this stuff earlier in the video, if you remember correctly. But that's it for ledge grabbing. We're finished there. Let's jump back over to where it's initialized. We want to set if dashing was used in case you did a dashing jump. Disable gravity so you don't fall. Speed is zero here. Now that might sound redundant, setting the speed dot y there and then setting it here, but this method is used for a lot of things, so we can't touch it. We do need speed dot x to also be zero here, though. That's horizontal movement, and we play a sound effect. And that's pretty much it. You're now grabbed onto the ledge. It's going to go through the animation, which I'll briefly show you guys that, just for S and G. If you don't know what S and G means, shits and giggles. We have two animations here. Here's the ledge grab one. There are no animation events or anything in here at all. And you can actually see the hitbox for the player character here as well on screen. It's that green box is moving ever so slightly. Again, that's a hitbox or hurt box, not his collision box with solids. That's separate and it is right here. A bit confusing to look at in a video, I know. But this is why I clicked on one first than the other. See? Hurt box, look how small that is. Collider box with solids, this other one around it. Let's jump back over to the code. Because now we need to go back to the collision code for ledge climb up. Remember that ledge climb collider? We talked about this one a couple of minutes ago. We're going to go ahead and use that to check for an impassable solid. And with one exception, is it a slope there? If only a slope was hit, we need to indicate that and we can continue on. If we hit any other kind of solid, we can't climb up, exit out now. Now, if we don't hit a solid of any kind, this is going to return true. So our life just became very, very easy, and we would automatically go over to the ledge climb up animation. And that's assuming the player is holding up, where well, you can see climb up ledge is under the controls, and all it does is check, are you in the ledge grab state? The animation's gone far enough in that the cape settled into place. And do you have the room to climb up? In which case, we're going to go to ledge climb. 
Sorry if I jumped a little bit there, but I wanted to make sure that you guys are able to grasp what's going on here. So pretty simple stuff. That's where this is called from when it attempts to climb up a ledge only when you're hanging from a ledge. So we're not again running code unnecessarily. However, if you touched a slope, I want you guys to go ahead and briefly look at this scenario. He's hanging from a slope right now. Okay. Let's look at his collider. Here's his ledge grab collider. First, let's highlight the slope because it's a bit finicky to get that in view. Here's his ledge gap collider. Oops, excuse me. Wrong one. His ledge grab collider. See, I keep mixing it up. It's a little hard to see, so I'm going to zoom in quite a bit. There's that one magic pixel. Here's the slope. Now, I want you guys to think about this for a second here. What's going to happen if we check ledge climb up? You see it? It's inside of a slope. So that would give us a false reading. We're inside a solid. If we did not have this here, this exception that checked for a slope, which if you hit a slope like this scenario, check if there is space to stand on the slope. That's this method. Again, we're using the ledge climb collider. I have a variable that says how high slopes can be. Again, I think it's four to six pixels, but it's not really relevant. What it's gonna do is gonna check within that range and it's gonna move up a pixel each time. The ledge climb collider is gonna move up a pixel, gonna sync the transform, and we're again gonna check if we're still touching a solid. If nothing was hit, we're done. We're good to go. We set the ledge climb collider to its starting position and return true because now we know he can climb onto the slope. If that's not the case that something was hit, well, now we need to check each one of those colliders that were hit and see if it's an impassable solid. If it is, we don't have enough room to move. Again, we're going to go through our loop and keep checking until we reach the max slope height, at which point we're going to say there's no room to climb up. He can't climb up here. There's something in the way. On the other hand, if on the other side, we end up in a situation where we didn't hit a solid. Congratulations, we have enough free space. We're going to reset the ledge climb collider and return two. And we're going to return two. Return true. Third time's the charm. You all have to excuse me. It's taking me four hours to record this video, and the video is only going to be 30 minutes long. So, yes, this takes some effort to do, fellas, for those who've never done video production. I can only imagine what people who do things like those death battle videos or game or film theory videos the hell they must go through doing those things dear god talk about a nightmare and if we get down here well guess what that just means we kept hitting solids the whole time so we're good to go we're not going to be climbing up now this one we're going to get to in a second blocked while climbing up but right now let's say we're in a scenario where return true we can climb up so it's going to go to the animation ledge climb jumping back to that and again i know this is a lot here so you know i apologize if i've lost anybody this is why i'm trying to go very slow and be detailed without being overtly detailed there are animation events here each of these is for the movement it's going to move him x and y y's as needed due to these animation events That's why you see it jump around a little bit like that. But let's jump right over to this event here. So you can see what is going on. So here we go. All it's doing is it's moving him up 14 pixels YYs on the first event. On the second event, 5 pixels YYs. And then right here is the big one, where it's going to try to move him on to the ledge itself. He's going to move to the direction he's facing, 6 pixels, left or right. And he's also going to move up the last, those last 31 pixels. And then what we need to do is every time we move, we need to ensure we're not blocked while climbing up. If we are, that's where you see him go into the falling animation. Here, we just, I just showed you guys a moment ago this collision script. I'm going to pull it up in detail this time. Again, we just moved, so we need to sync the transforms and check his middle overlap collider. That's that big one in the middle of him that I pointed out several times. If you're stuck in a solid, well, we need to return true back to the method over here, the event. And we need to make him start falling. We've got an issue here. There's something in our way. You'll also notice it's going to reset him back to the position before he moved so he does not become stuck. That's very important, guys. Otherwise, you're now stuck in a solid. On the other hand, though, if he's not stuck in a solid, we need to go ahead and check if we've moved him on step number. Let me go ahead and see if I can explain this without confusing the shit out of everybody. This is case zero, step zero. When you do programming, you start with zero, not one. 
So this is the first time we moved him. Step zero. Second time is step one. Third time is step two. This is when he moved forward. Now he couldn't have moved up if he was there was something in the way because of this. So now we moved him up and forward. We need to go ahead and do an additional check and see if when we checked his middle collider, if he's stuck at a slope, which think about this here. If he moved up, there's nothing in the way here, but when he moved forward, what's gonna happen with this collider? It's gonna be over here where there's a slope. It's gonna be here on top of this slope right here. So he's gonna technically be stuck at a slope. That's the reading we're gonna get back from our collision engine. So now what we need to do is we need to look at the max potential slope height and we need to try to move the player up that number. Again, I think this is like four to six pixels, guys. You know, we're going to try to move him up one by one here. Sync the transforms, check his middle. He's not stuck on a slope. He's not blocked while climbing up. We can stop checking. We don't need to keep checking the rest of the pixels until we reach this number. He's instantly done. He can climb up on there. On the other hand, if he's still stuck in one, we want to keep looping. Now, what's going to happen is when this loop is done, if he's still stuck on a slope, which there's not a lot of ways I could think of this happening other than somehow something moved in the way here, which shouldn't be physically possible. But again, when you do your collision engine, eh, prepare for things that you might consider them be impossible because shit happens, guys. So, okay, if you can't move, we're just going to be put back into place and fall. And if you can, we're going to move into position and we're going to climb up. And let's just see that right now because he is hanging from a slope here. Let's go ahead and watch that. Okay, so let's see what happens when he tries to climb onto this ledge with a slope in the way. And I've set this to be like one-tenth normal time scale so that hopefully you guys can see what's going on here. It's a bit difficult still, so I'm going to go ahead and pause the game in the middle of it doing it. You can see he moved up. That's step two we're up to already. It happens very quickly. Here's step three. Now, these are up here because he's moving around and he's in his crouching collider box. But you can see he instantly pulled himself up onto the slope there. It's a little hard to explain in more detail I already have. So, I mean, hopefully visually this helps you guys. But if not, I don't know what else to say. You know, I apologize if it's a bit confusing. But here, just so you can see how smooth it is in regular motion. Okay, last but not least, I wanted to make sure I mentioned this method, which is directly above the one that moves the player. And that simply checks, do we release the ledge we're holding on to? Long story made short. If you're not in the ledge grab state, no need to run it. If you are, it'll run that method we talked about earlier for initially grabbing onto the ledge and check and see if you still can grab onto a ledge. If you can, we are good to go and there's nothing else to do. If you cannot, it's going to go to the fall state and that's it. You'll let go of the ledge. All right. And with that, I hope that this video was somewhat informative to anybody out there who might be starting off with unity and it can be a bit of a headache at first but for anybody who's just starting out in unity please do not let these things dissuade you i started off the same way you did knowing two things jack and shit and now here we are making a video on youtube talking about how to do something involving a collision engine which i never saw myself doing but hey if you're considering diving into unity do it we've all got to start off somewhere it's the only way you'll get better Trust me, if I can do it, anybody can. I will also say that that is by far the hardest part is wrapping your head around the logic. Because if you know the methods and the syntax for the language you're working with, the hardest part is, again, just wrapping your head around the concept of, okay, I'm hanging from a ledge. How can I get stuck here? Hmm, what if there's something above moving downward? Hmm, what if I'm in a ledge that, here's an interesting one for you guys. What if I'm hanging from a ledge and I'm on a moving platform and I move down and end up on a slope? What should my character do? That's actually something I just thought of right now that I'm going to have to go back and look at because I don't believe my code actually anticipates that. Yeah, just even having this discussion with you guys has made me think of a couple of ways I might be able to break my own engine. All right, so that's it. I think I'm going to close the video here. Um, again, feel free to leave feedback below. If anybody has an advice on how I can improve on these, by all means, leave a comment down below. If you have a request... I unfortunately only take requests from Patreon supporters. I just do not have the time to take requests from everybody who makes them. And most of my videos past the first day or two, I don't even see the comments or I don't even respond to the comments, I should say. I see all of them and I appreciate the feedback, guys. But my life is very busy. The joys of being an adult. So, all right, that's it. If you're not a Patreon supporter, please go join right now. You can make a one-time donation as well. The link is down below. I think my next video is going to talk about how I set up my states because I think that's a huge part of understanding what's going on here. And I think that would definitely 
help, excuse me, anybody who's a newbie at Unity to maybe get their feet wet and start off in the right direction. Anyway, again, thank you to all of my Patreon supporters, and thank you to everybody out there who's believed in me for the project. I hope you all like what you're seeing. Like the video, subscribe. I will talk to you all soon. Deuces.